Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host with another marvellous video. In the Terminator franchise, the idea of altering the future by changing the past is a recurring theme. With each instalment, the franchise has delved deeper into the complexities of time travel and the consequences of altering the timeline. However, some important scenes have been cut from the movies that could have drastically altered the franchise's direction. It turns out that James Cameron nearly incorporated a subplot in the original film that would have essentially used up Terminator 2 Judgment Day's plot. However, if Cameron had refreshed from cutting key moments from the original, it could have been a waste of potential. These deleted scenes hold crucial information that could have been used to tie the various installments together in a more cohesive manner. From Sarah Connor's struggles with fate to the origins of Skynet, the deleted scenes in the Terminator franchise reveal the potential paths that the movies could have taken if they'd not been left on the cutting room floor. In this video, we'll explore all 84 major deleted and altered scenes in the Terminator franchise. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The Terminator, 1984. Arnold's arrival in the past would have cost Cameron a bunch of money. In the original cut of the sci-fi classic, there was a scene featuring Arnold Schwarzenegger's cyborg character arriving in present-day Los Angeles. However, this scene was deemed unsatisfactory by director James Cameron and was reshot with his own money long after principal photography had ended. According to Donald Jackson, the substitute cinematographer for the reshoot, the scene was originally filmed in a schoolyard before Cameron was able to secure permission to shoot at Griffith Observatory. Jackson and shot the new scene featuring Schwarzenegger's naked arrival at the iconic location, as well as several other scenes in the film. During filming, the Union crew was due for their lunch break, which could potentially result in overtime payments for Schwarzenegger. Cameron and Jackson improvised by using a small portable light known as a mini cool and had Cameron hold it and pan it as Schwarzenegger walked through the scene, resulting in a successful shot and no overtime for the star. Sarah's reflection on her own personality. In another deleted scene, Sarah Connor is seen opening her locker at Big Jeff's restaurant and smiling wryly at her reflection in the mirror. The shot serves to establish Sarah's character and her place in the world as a waitress, but ultimately didn't make the final cut of the film. Director James Cameron is known for his use of mirror shots in his films, as they allow for a character to have a dialogue with themselves. However, he ultimately decided that this scene wasn't necessary, as there was already enough information about Sarah's life and reality established in the film. While the scene may have been cut, it can still be found on the special edition and ultimate edition DVDs of the Terminator, as well as in the original script and novelization. Though brief, the scene offers a glimpse into Sarah's worldview and her struggle to find her place in the world as a young woman in a dead-end job. Sarah confronts her reflection in the mirror, pondering its absurdity. She pinches her cheeks, smiles vacuously. Sarah Connor is not a unique name. In the original cut of The Terminator, after the cyborg kills the first Sarah Connor, he calmly leaves and strolls to his car, unperturbed by the chaos he's caused in the neighborhood. Although it was cut due to time constraints, the scene highlights the Terminator's complete indifference toward his heinous act. With complete indifference to the screams of the horrified neighborhood, the Terminator walks at a steady pace to his car, embodying the terrifying notion that he could commit murder in broad daylight without breaking a sweat. And of course, it showcases Schwarzenegger's acting ability and remains one of those rare Terminator scenes that were remitted from the final film. Additionally, director James Cameron felt that the scene didn't progress the story as well as it could have, and therefore it was ultimately left out of the final cut. Nevertheless, it can still be viewed on the special edition and ultimate edition DVDs of the film, and also appears in the movie's scripts and novelization. In fact, the earlier drafts of the script intended this scene to be longer, so Terminator was supposed to ring the bell, and an elderly woman would have answered it. This woman, the mother of the wrong Sarah Connor, would have told the Terminator that she was a upstairs. The mother then runs after seeing the Terminator cock his gun. After killing this Sarah Connor, he would have examined her body because he knew that the real Sarah Connor had metal fixtures in her tibia. Beige versus Peach In this deleted scene, Sarah seeks fashion advice from her roommate Ginger before her date with a guy she thinks is a schmuck. Holding up various blouses, Sarah asks Ginger for her opinion, but Ginger's unhelpful and cold responses lead Sarah to realize that she doesn't really care what she wears. Eventually, Ginger suggests the beige blouse, but Sarah ultimately decides against it, only to reconsider moments later. In the fifth draft of the script, the blouse's color was changed to Peach from Beige. After Sarah's frantic phone call, police officers bring into action to protect her from the ruthless Terminator. There were five exciting moments that show how the cops had been working tirelessly to track down the killer cyborg and keep Sarah safe, but these were all deleted. Let's take a look. 
Part 1. As the frantic call from Sarah finally reaches the police at Tech Noir, Lieutenant Traxler and Sergeant Yukovich leap into action to apprehend her kidnapper. They exit the station and mount a police light atop their car, following which the investigators tear out of the parking lot and into the night in pursuit of the elusive and unknown perpetrator so that they can rescue Sarah and bring her captor to justice. Part 2 and 3 Lieutenant Traxler and Sergeant Yukovich arrive on a street to await Sarah Connor's abductor, and it's not before long that their wait is cut short. The two cops notice a black car that belonged to the perpetrator. The unmistakable sound of a revving engine catches their attention. Lieutenant Traxler orders another cop car to begin the pursuit before sitting in his car that was being driven by Sergeant Yukovich. Both the cars follow the black car, marking the beginning of the chase sequence. Part 4 In this scene, Lieutenant Traxler has been listening to Carl Reese's story of time travel and a killer robot sent back in time to kill Sarah Connor. As Reese finishes his story with the ominous statement, It's just him and me. Lieutenant Traxler closes the door, clearly concerned about the situation. Sergeant Vukovic tries to assure Lieutenant Traxler that Reese is just another crazy person, but Traxler can't shake his unease. He hopes Vukovic is right and that Reese's story is nothing more than the ramblings of a delusional person. It's a tense moment that would have left the audience fall deeper into the story story, alas. Part 5 Lieutenant Traxler, having encountered the unstoppable and brutal force of the Terminator firsthand, understands the gravity of the situation. He knows that Sarah and Reese are up against an adversary that is beyond human capabilities, and he fears for their safety. In a moment of bravery and selflessness, Lieutenant Traxler offers Reese his own weapon, recognizing that Reese is the only hope Sarah has against the deadly machine. He puts his faith in a seemingly crazy time traveler to save the woman who's the key to the future. Someone needs to give this man a cookie. Director James Cameron wanted more scenes involving police detectives Traxler and Vukovic, but they were cut in order to keep the focus on the main characters and to speed up the pacing of the film. He wanted to get to the point where Reese explained the situation to Sarah as quickly as possible, without too many questions and moments of suspense. The film's internal rules dictated that the throttle be held down and only backed off for specific dramatic points. The much-needed bond After the shocking revelation of the future, Sarah Connor takes matters into her own hands and seeks out Cyberdyne Systems. Her intention is to destroy the company and prevent the creation of the advanced AI that will lead to the destruction of mankind. However, her trusted protector and soldier from the future, Kyle Reese, disagrees and urges her to stay low and avoid any unnecessary risks. A heated argument ensues and Sarah storms off, followed by Reese. But as they struggle, something unexpected happens. Sarah sees a vulnerable and emotional side of Reese that she never saw before, and it changes everything. In a world where trust is hard to come by, the bond between the two becomes stronger than ever. You, all, so beautiful. It hurts, Sarah. More than death. Don't you understand? It's all gone. We can change it, Kyle. We have to try. There's no fate but what we make for ourselves. Right? Come on. Let's go, kiddo. What do you say? Sarah and Reese hoping for an optimistic future. In this scene, Sarah and Reese are shown making bombs as they discover the possibility of a normal existence after their mission is over. The scene aims to provide a character-driven moment where Sarah comes to terms with her place in the universe and her desire for a normal life. It balances frivolousness with poignancy, showcasing the human side of the characters amidst the chaos of their battle. However, the scene was ultimately cut to preserve the film's intense and urgent mood, as the characters have little time to think about anything other than their mission. Despite being deleted, this scene provides an interesting insight into the characters and their motivations, and is a worthwhile addition for fans of the film. Sarah, I want to buy you a hot dog so bad, Kyle. All the things you've never seen and done. You're here, but wherever you go and whatever you touch, you bring the war with you. Reese, my whole life has been combat. Sarah, I want it to be over for you. No tickles for the time traveler. In this deleted scene, we see a playful and intimate moment between Sarah and Reese. After making love, Sarah tickles Reese, showing a tender and affectionate side of their relationship. The scene also highlights the possibility of a different life for Reese, a life where he and Sarah could have been together under different circumstances. However, this scene was ultimately cut from the film to maintain the intense and suspenseful tone of the impending battle with the Terminator. In its place, a more subtle moment was added, with Reese briefly smiling as Sarah playfully pretends to toss bombs at him before they hear the barking of the Terminator's approaching dog a scene that Cameron regretted deleting. In one of the scenes, a technician and his assistant are shown examining the remains of the Terminator in a Cyberdyne Systems building. The technician orders his assistant to take the CPU to research and development while Sarah is being lifted into an ambulance. Director James Cameron regretted cutting this scene as it laid the seed for the creation of Skynet, the supercomputer that would play a major role in the sequels as the big bad villain. However, he ultimately decided that the scene wasn't necessary as audiences were already speculating about the possibility of the Terminator being rebuilt or repaired. Cameron believed 
that sometimes the questions left unanswered could be just as effective at engaging the audience. And although deleted from the original, the scene found itself in the second installment of the franchise. Toned Down Murder of a Weapon Store Owner In a lesser-known alternate version of The Terminator, released exclusively for Canadian television audiences, we see a different take on the scene where the Terminator guns down the owner of a weapon store. Unlike the theatrical version, which graphically depicts the brutal murder on screen, this version takes a more subdued approach. Instead of seeing the owner get blown away, we hear the sound of the shotgun blast and see the door of the shop swing open from the outside. This alternative approach was likely chosen to avoid excessive violence on television and to appeal to a wider audience. Nonetheless, it offers a unique viewing experience for those who have only seen the theatrical version of the film when the F-word became scum. When The Terminator was aired on TV in the US, several scenes were altered to comply with broadcast standards. The dialogue of witnesses who see both The Terminator and Reese arrive from the future is edited to remove any offensive language. In the scene where The Terminator visits the wrong Sarah and shoots her, the original scene of him firing six shots is changed to one shot with the sound of the gunshot removed. The scenes of Kyle hot-wiring cars and a kid dropping food down Sarah's blouse in a restaurant are also edited. In another altered scene, the dialogue of the punks confronted by the Terminator is changed, with Bill Paxton's original response of an F-word slang replaced with Eat This Scum. The brutal scene of the Terminator ripping out the heart of one of the punks is removed, and instead just shows him picking him up and glaring at another punk who surrenders his clothes. In a later scene, the camera is moved upwards to avoid showing the buttocks of both the Terminator and Reese as they walk toward the edge of a building. Cut for being comical Early drafts of the Terminator included a scene where the titular character steals a car from an elderly woman and mimics her erratic driving before ultimately crashing and driving off. This was meant to demonstrate the robot's ability to imitate human behavior, but it was likely cut due to concerns that the scene was too comical for the film's serious tone. A similar moment did appear in Terminator 2, with the T-1000 mimicking a suburban mom, but opinions vary on whether it was successful in being scary or ended up being a bit laughable. Reese had a silly partner In early drafts of The Terminator, Kyle Reese had a time-traveling companion named Sumner who met a gruesome end upon their arrival in 1984. The original script offered a mumbled explanation that Summoner didn't make it through after he was mangled into a fire escape. While this could have been a memorable death, it would have been more of a casualty due to Summoner's terrible planning skills and extremely poor spatial awareness, rather than becoming another victim of the Terminator's wrath. Therefore, this darkly comedic moment was rightfully cut from the final film. Original Ending The original ending of The Terminator was less thought-provoking and complex than what we get to see in the final product. It ended with Reese surviving the tanker explosion, resulting in a shorter and less costly movie. However, when the iconic factory scene was cut, director James Cameron insisted on adding it back to give the film a more dramatic and impactful ending, as well as setting up the sequel's finale. Although the original ending would have still made for a good sci-fi horror, the finished product is undoubtedly a classic. A beautifully horrific concept art. Although not in the original script, a potential scene that could have added more horror to the Terminator was inspired by concept art. Director James Cameron dreamt of a scene in which the Terminator emerges from a wall of flames, revealing its robotic skeleton as its skin melts off. The concept art took it further, depicting a slasher-like skeletal Terminator crawling on all fours with a butcher's knife in hand, an unsettling and unforgettable image. And no, this isn't something absurd as Jason X's cyborg Uber Jason. This stuff was supposed to be uber cool. Although too expensive to film in the original, it's a shame that such an iconic and impactful image never made it to the screen, and none of the subsequent Terminator sequels have utilized it either. Terminator 2 Judgment Day 1991 Brief picturization of the future war. The scene is tense as a damaged endoskeleton lies on the ground, desperately grasping for its plasma rifle. Suddenly, a resistant soldier charges onto the scene, firing relentlessly at the metal monster until it finally falls silent. But just as the first soldier prepares to move on, another resistance fighter appears out of nowhere, snatching the precious weapon from the defeated robot's grip. It's a heart-pounding moment that adds an extra layer of intensity to this already action-packed scene. Sadistic Doctors in a harrowing and gut-wrenching moment, the veil of civility is lifted when Silberman's visit with his students takes a twisted turn. With a chilling command, he orders the sadistic Douglas to force-feed medication to a struggling and helpless Sarah, exposing the inhumanity and brutality that lurks within the walls of Pescadero. Though this scene was ultimately cut from the final film for time considerations, it was also deemed unnecessary to further emphasize the harsh and unforgiving environment of Pescadero. Instead, the audience's sympathy for Sarah is developed gradually through her struggles and triumphs in the course of the story. While the omission of this scene may have weakened the setup for Douglas's eventual comeuppance, the slimy and despicable nature of his character is well established in a later scene. The Effect of the Medication 
Sarah's medication-induced trance takes her on a journey through time and space. She is visited by the ghostly figure of Kyle Reese, who implores her to protect their son from the impending danger that looms on the horizon. As Sarah chases after the apparition, she finds herself transported to a playground filled with playing children. But what should be a place of innocence and joy becomes a nightmarish hellscape, as Sarah realizes that this is the same playground from her dreams. In a dazzling explosion of light, Sarah is jolted back to reality, her mind reeling from the experience. It's a moment that leaves the audience breathless and on the edge of their seats, wondering what other horrors and revelations lie in store for Sarah and her son. T-1000 Hunts for John The wreckage of a fiery truck crash draws a team of firefighters who struggle to contain the blaze. Meanwhile, in the midst of the chaos, the T-1000 seamlessly blends in with a group of arriving cops, biding his time as he prepares to unleash his deadly mission. With his target in sight, the relentless killing machine calmly approaches a car and slips inside. And so begins the electrifying pursuit of John Connor, a high-stakes game of cat and mouse that takes the audience on a white-knuckle ride through the streets of Los Angeles. But before the T-1000 reaches the Galleria and asks two girls about John, they tell him that he can find John at the Galleria, the location to which T-1000 doesn't know. The girls can hardly contain their disbelief that someone could be unaware of the Galleria's whereabouts and end up giggling. T-1000 kills a dog the T-1000 approaches a big German Shepherd, who cowers in fear and barks in a warning. In a swift and deadly move, the T-1000 reaches down and the audience hears a sickening thunk and a yelp. The T-1000 then holds up a bloody collar with the name tag of Max, nodding thoughtfully as it heads back to the house. While this scene was filmed, it was ultimately left out of the final cut as it was deemed unnecessary. Instead, the audience is left to infer much of the T-1000's tracking of John through Terminator's own search. T-1000 Investigating John's Room As the T-1000 prowls through the darkened hallway, it passes by the bathroom, where we catch a glimpse of Janelle's legs through the ajar door. The sound of the shower running is drowned out by the sickening sight of blood mixing with water on the white tile floor. Undeterred, the T-1000 continues its search of John's bedroom. It tears apart the room in search of any clue that could lead it to its target. The metallic assassin comes across a box of audio cassettes labeled Messages from Mom and begins sifting through them, revealing snapshots of Sarah and John during their missing years. In one photo, Sarah dons olive camos and teaches John how to aim an RPG-7 grenade launcher. In another, she stands alongside a group of military-lad Guatemalan men next to cases of Stinger missiles. And in yet another, we see John and Sarah deep in the mountains at a Contra camp. T-1000 drags the dead Lewis. As the T-1000, disguised as a guard named Lewis, walks down the hospital hallway, the night nurse steals a quick glance at him. She notices him dragging something, but it's hidden beneath the counter. Curiosity getting the better of her, she inquires about the object. The T-1000, still in character as Lewis, dismisses her question, claiming it's just trash, and the nurse returns to her work. The T-1000 continues down the hall, pulling the lifeless guard behind him. With a quick motion, the T-1000 retrieves the guard's pistol and keys before shoving his body into a utility closet. However, the sequence was deemed superfluous. Can the T-1000 be killed or destroyed? As the car speeds away from Pescadero Hospital, Sarah and the Terminator exchange a few more words. Sarah, desperate for any information that might give her an edge, asks the Terminator if the T-1000 can be destroyed. The machine responds with a curt, unknown, leaving Sarah to wonder if there's any hope in stopping the relentless killing machine that's hot on their heels. Though the scene was filmed, it ultimately hit the cutting room floor, with only a glimpse of it surviving in the film's trailer. Sarah almost killed the good guy. In a dingy garage, Sarah Connor and her son John work on the Terminator. John wants to know if the machine can learn, so he can become more human and less of a dork all the time. The Terminator replies in his characteristic monotone voice that his CPU is a neural net processor, a learning computer. However, Skynet has set the switch to read only when sent out alone, preventing the Terminator from thinking too much. John asks if they can reset the switch, and Sarah agrees to open the port cover in the Terminator's scalp. Sarah uses an X-Acto knife to cut into the Terminator to scalp, revealing a maintenance port for the CPU. She removes the chip, a reddish-brown ceramic rectangle that looks like a domino made up of small cubes, identical to the one that Miles Dyson had in the vault at Cyberdyne Systems. John asks Sarah to reset the pin switch so they can write new programming to the Terminator's neural net processor. Sarah, however, wants to destroy the chip, not trusting that the Terminator won't turn on them. John pleads with her, reminding her that the chip is the only proof they have of the future and the impending war. He convinces her to let him reset the switch and insert the chip back into the Terminator's skull. As the Terminator powers back up, John asks him if there was a problem, to which the machine responds with its trademark catchphrase, No problem. None whatsoever. Out of all T2 deleted scenes, I'm the sorriest about this one here. It would have been such a wonderful addition.
John asks Terminator to smile more often. As they pull into a roadside gas station, Sarah asks John for cash. He hands over his ready teller money, and Sarah takes it all, leaving him with 20 to get some food. John tries to lighten the mood with Terminator, suggesting he should smile once in a while. He points to some teenagers laughing nearby, but Terminator's attempts at a smile are dismal. John suggests he practice in front of a mirror. The scene ends with Terminator still trying to perfect his smile. Dyson's obsession with his work in this rather important scene from the film, we see the complexities of Dyson's character unfold before us. As a workaholic obsessed with his invention, the neural net processor, Dyson is blinded by the thrill of discovery and the desire to create a better world. But his wife Teresa reminds him that he must also prioritize his role as a father to their son and daughter. Does the Terminator feel pain? John is selecting rifles from a long rack while Terminator returns with several cases of ammo. He grabs an AK-47, but upon inspection, he puts it back. His movements are efficient professional and uninterested. John then asks Terminator if he ever feels afraid. Terminator pauses for a second before saying no, and John asks if he feels any emotions about dying. Again, Terminator responds with a no. He explains that he has to stay functional until his mission is complete, and then it doesn't matter. John, still idly spinning a 6 or 9mm pistol on his finger, sarcastically sings, I'm too important. Terminator pulls back a tarp and reveals a powerful weapon with six barrels clustered in a blunt cylinder. Of course, it's a GE minigun, the most feared anti-personnel weapon of the Vietnam era. Terminator hefts it, looks at John, and asks if he can use it. John nods, and Terminator grins, ready for action. Sarah and Dyson at the lab Sarah bursts into Dyson's office, her eyes locked on her target. She began hurtling everything in sight out of the door, books, files, and anything on the desk. Dyson's prized possessions were now flying through the air and landing on the junk pile outside. The framed photo of Dyson's wife and kids landed on top of the heap. Sarah's laser designator lit up the room, creating an eerie atmosphere. Soon we see Dyson, and he paused for a moment, catching his breath. He reached for the axe that Terminator had been using and took it in his hand. Dyson's eyes rested on the lab table in front of him, on which sat another prototype processor. He brought the axe down onto the processor prototype, exploding it into fragments. His shoulder was in agony, but he looked satisfied. Radio Did you know that there's an alternate audio on the police radio in the original cut of the movie when the police and SWAT team arrive at Cyberdyne? In the original cut, there's a voice saying that a Cyberdyne suspect is wanted in the murder of police officers in 1984. The alternate sound also has a voice asking for the location of the building, which helps to ground the audience in the scene and make it feel more real. It's interesting to note that the sounds are separated into two parts, which gives the audio a more layered and complex feel. Three of the T-1000 glitch shots were deleted. You know the part where the T-1000 starts glitching and malfunctioning in the steel mill, right? Well, there were actually three glitch shots that were completed but ultimately cut from the final film due to pacing and narrative reasons. The first glitch shot, which showed the T-1000 dealing with a glitch in its hand, was cut because it interrupted the chase scene's pace. The second shot, which depicted the T-1000's feet melting into the metal diamond plate floor, was deemed too bizarre and difficult to grasp. And the third shot, which featured a chrome glitch line crossing the T-1000's face, was also cut because it was hard to understand. Despite these omissions, there's still a surviving hint of the glitch motif in the film. In one scene, the T-1000 pins the Terminator's arm in the chain drive gear and turns to look for John as a chrome glitch wipes across his face. Sarah and John escaping T-1000 Furthermore, an extended walk of Sarah and John through the steel mill environment was also cut from the film. This scene shows John recognizing which Sarah is the real one by looking at her feet, which have melted together with the floor due to the T-1000's glitching. However, this moment became confusing and unnecessary without the earlier glitch shots, which was cut from the final film. Instead, the audience is already clued in on which Sarah it is, which by seeing her with a shotgun in a previous scene, and John figures it out because he knows the T-1000 wouldn't hesitate to shoot at him first. Removal of Superfluous Dialogues in Judgment Day, certain non-essential lines were cut to maintain the emotional focus on the relationship between John and the Terminator. For example, Terminator's line, I am the future, which was initially included, lost much of its impact due to the fact that the pivotal half-faced look had already been established in previous scenes. Therefore, emphasizing it again seemed heavy-handed and unnecessary. Similarly, Sarah's question, are you afraid, was also cut from the scene because it no longer had any context after an earlier weapons cache scene, in which John and Terminator discuss fear and was omitted from the final film. The future park ending was let go of for the sake of narrative ambiguity. The final scene of Terminator 2 shows Sarah and John at the steel mill, followed by a shot of a dark highway at night. Sarah's voiceover says, The unknown future rolls toward us. I face it for the first time with a sense of hope, because if a machine, a Terminator, can learn the value of human life, maybe we can, too. Now, the future coda or future park ending was filmed and completed, but was ultimately cut from the final film. 
This decision was made for a variety of reasons. Firstly, a definitive and happy ending felt out of place with the emotional tone of the film. Secondly, the sunny park in Washington and the futuristic buildings felt jarring and inconsistent with the visual style of the rest of the film. Thirdly, the ending effectively negated the storylines of both the first film and the first sequence in Terminator 2, raising questions about the grandfather paradox of time travel stories without adequate time to address them. Additionally, from a character standpoint, it was difficult to accept Sarah as a contented old observer after seeing her as an intense and athletic heroine throughout the film. Finally, the fact that John, a juvenile delinquent linked to a massive spree of destruction at age 10, became a senator raised logistical questions. Ultimately, the decision to maintain a sense of narrative ambiguity and leave the future open-ended felt more in keeping with the overall tone of the film. Alternate Shots Not surprisingly, there were quite a few alternate shots that never really made it into the final film. Let's quickly take a look at them. These shots include a slightly different angle of the T-1000's walk in the Galleria Mall an alternate shot of Terminator and John driving through a canal, and an alternate angle of the tanker rollover. As it appears in the trailer, this time there are two. But the list doesn't end there. There's also an alternate shot of the T-1000 on a motorcycle inside the Cyberdyne Systems building, which gives us a different perspective of the helicopter's full turn around the building's corner. And let's not forget the alternate angles during the T-1000's attack, including one where he hits the T-800 with a steel bar. Furthermore, we also have an alternate angle of Sarah and John ducking away from the T-1000 and giving the T-800 a clear shot, as it appears in the T-2 trailer. This time, there are two. An alternate future war In an earlier version of T2, the future war sequence was vastly different, with John Connor providing the narration instead of Sarah. Not only did the scene depict the defeat of Skynet, but it also introduced new machines, such as the four-poster flying Hunter Killer, the Centurion Tank Crab Hybrid, and the trilobite-like Silverfish Anti-Personnel Device. However, due to time and budget constraints, this extended sequence was ultimately cut from the final screenplay. While rich in action and resonance with the first film's concepts, the scene would have detracted from the main story and required an excessive amount of resources to produce. Additionally, the initial idea of having snow-covered terrain to depict nuclear winter was discarded early on, for being too difficult to explain in a battle sequence. But that's not all. There were four more about the future war that were omitted from the final draft. Blown Up Terminator According to the creative supervisor Van Ling, in T2, the book of the film, an illustrated screenplay, Several scenes from the future war in the first Terminator film were left on the cutting room floor. One such scene involved Arnold Schwarzenegger's bodybuilding buddy, Franco Colombo, playing a blown open Terminator lying on the ground, groping for its weapon, while another showed a Terminator with rotting flesh on its face, exploring the idea of a damaged Terminator. Skynet's Time Displacement Complex there was a scene that featured the interior of Skynet's Time Displacement Complex and the Time Displacement Equipment, which was finally intended to be included in the opening of T2. The design included three rotating rings on each axis, which were to be the power focus of the entire chamber. To hide Kyle Reese's nakedness as he tumbled within the whirling rings, the scene proved to be difficult to execute. Terminator Storage Room Another omitted scene from the future war was the storage room for unactivated Terminators, which included the one that protected John Connor in T2. Behind an ice-covered door, hundreds of Terminators in suspended animation await activation. The rows of cold storage racks were designed as a one-third scale foreground miniature, with a few full-sized racks featuring live casts of Arnold and a few other models, including a woman. Hyber Matrix Lastly, the Hyber Matrix design was an elaboration on the flesh form mold design for the T2 teaser spot, suggesting the molding process used to grow flesh around the metal Terminator endoskeleton. Overall, while these scenes were fascinating in their own right, they were ultimately cut due to their narrative tangents and the high costs of production. T-800 vs. T-800 instead of T-800 vs. T-1000 In the early stages of developing Terminator 2, one of the story ideas that was considered was having two Arnold Schwarzenegger-looking Terminators, one good and one bad, battling with each other. However, James Cameron ultimately decided against this concept because he felt it was gimmicky and because it would have required Arnold to wear appliance makeup for the entirety of the five-month shooting schedule. Cameron also realized that if the audience was going to root for the good Terminator, the bad Terminator would have to be more threatening and powerful. They explored other possibilities, including a female Terminator, but ultimately returned to the idea of a shape-shifting villain, as it stayed true to the basic concept of the Terminator as an infiltration unit. Moreover, getting a big bad woman who could look more threatening than Arnold would have been extremely difficult. Nevertheless, we do get TX in the third installment. Terminator 3 – Rise of the Machines 2003 alternate opening sequence. In an early iteration of Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines, the film's opening scene featured a despairing John Connor perched on a bridge, 
contemplating suicide. This intriguing concept delves into the age-old question of destiny versus choice that the series has explored before. Would John's decision to end his own life negate the entire Terminator timeline? Unfortunately, the film's producers ultimately decided to scrap this darker beginning, leaving fans to ponder. The Death of Elizabeth Anderson In a deleted scene from Terminator 3, the TX continues her deadly mission by heading upstairs to eliminate Bill Anderson's sister, Elizabeth, while Alana Curry's character, Tammy Triggs, mourns over Bill's lifeless body. However, this scene was ultimately cut from the final version of the movie as director Jonathan Mostow felt it would be repetitive, since we're already witnessing the TX killing Bill earlier in the film. A curious mystery about one of TX's victims. One of the most puzzling moments in Terminator 3 involves the TX's killing at the vet clinic. In the movie, we only hear a gunshot and see the woman Betsy falling to the ground. However, a behind-the-scenes picture shows the TX actually firing the gun. The background in the picture matches the scene where the TX samples the woman's blood, and it's not seen again after that. Therefore, it's clear that the picture isn't from the moment when the TX shoots at Kate. This leaves fans wondering why the filmmakers chose to show the TX shooting Betsy in the behind-the-scene picture, but not in the final cut of the movie. Was it a deleted scene, or simply an alternate take that was never intended to be used? The answer remains a mystery. The domestic trailer for Terminator 3 reveals cut scene. A small but noticeable continuity error occurs in Terminator 3 when the T-850 Terminator crashes the TX into the vet and then approaches Kate Brewster. In the final cut of the movie, the T-850 is shown getting out of the truck and walking towards Kate with his shotgun already in hand, leaving some viewers confused as to where the weapon came from. However, the domestic trailer for the film reveals that there was originally a scene where the T-850 retrieves the shotgun from the truck before walking toward Kate. This cutscene provides a missing piece of the puzzle and clears up any confusion surrounding the T-850's sudden appearance with the shotgun. The Tundra Trailer The LA Auto Show promoted the T3 Limited Edition Toyota Tundra by showing a special first T3 Tundra trailer, which featured footage of the champion crane chase instead of the bathroom fight scenes. There were scenes that were cut from the final movie, including the final police car getting shot by the TX's plasma cannon. The trailer showed various action scenes of the Tundra being chased by the champion crane and police cruisers, with the T850 driving and John in the passenger seat. The trailer ends with a shot of the TX punching the window of an automobile. Although a machine, Arnold knows how to make a statement. In a moment of iconic coolness, the Terminator comes to a stop in front of a rack of sunglasses. Without hesitation, he peruses the selection of shades and selects a pair of sleek summer wraparounds, sliding them onto his face with calculated precision. Just another reminder that even as a machine, the Terminator knows how to make a fashion statement. Difference from the trailer In the T3 domestic trailer, John Connor spoke about imagining a world of permanent darkness where machines control man's destiny, and imagining oneself as the only one who could stop it. He added that before doing so, something terrible would have to happen. In the movie, he reflected on the idea of knowing that one was destined to do something amazing and important, but realizing that something terrible had to happen first. He pondered that one couldn't live with oneself if they didn't try to stop it. Something terrible has to happen. You couldn't live with yourself if you didn't try to stop it, but... Scott's death sequence There have been rumors circulating about a more extended and gruesome death scene for Kate Brewster's fiancé, Scott, in which the TX uses her deadly rotary saw to bury into his face. Allegedly, the scene also includes shots of the TX taking on Scott's form and hiding his body. In the official T3 novel, the TX swiftly dispatches Scott with a single fatal blow, thrusting a hand deep into his chest and destroying his heart before he can even utter a sound. After which, he heads to the bathroom to clean the blood from her hand as if nothing happened, but she quickly senses incoming police frequencies and realizes she needs to act fast. She glances back at Scott's lifeless body and decides to take on his form, even donning his boxer shorts and t-shirts, as she prepares to infiltrate the world of the living undetected. TX repairs her weapons, the two deleted scenes. In the explosive cemetery battle between the T-850 and the TX, the T-850 manages to land a hit on the TX's plasma cannon with his RPG rocket launcher. The rocket causes the TX to be launched through the air, crashing through a tombstone. In a deleted scene, the TX assesses her damaged plasma cannon and quickly rips off the top of it. With her weapon now modified and ready for action, she rises to her feet and resumes the relentless pursuit of her targets. Later, TX examines her hand and reveals her damaged plasma cannon. In a display of her advanced technology, she quickly adjusts her weapon into a replaceable form, readying herself for the next battle. Sergeant Candy In the official T3 novel, 
A promotional video featuring Sergeant Candy showcases the evolution of robotics from the early factory machines to the advanced T1 battlefield robots and, finally, the cybernetic Terminators in full battle armor and infiltration coverings. The video also includes glimpses of high-tech workshops where the T1 robots are being prepared for service, with scientists and technicians in white lab coats meticulously checking every system in the machines. Interestingly, Candy was originally meant to be a human character who lent his likeness to the T-800 prototype and even had a larger role in an earlier draft of Terminator 3. However, since the Candy scene was eventually cut from the film, the gag about the T-850 resembling the character was also removed. Here, we see glimpses of an endoskeleton being constructed by a large machine. The T-1 units, which are more detailed in the next deleted scene, are also seen. These scenes offer a deeper look into the world of Terminator 3 and the technology behind the machines. Sergeant Candy's Other Deleted Scene in a sequence just before the T-850 faces off against the T-1 units, Robert Brewster recognizes something familiar about the cybernetic assassin. He calls out to the T-850, asking if he's Sergeant Candy. The T-850 denies it, but when Brewster presses him about where he came from, the machine calmly replies, I was made here. It's a revelation that sends Brewster reeling as he realizes the truth about the top-secret Terminator project. In a behind-the-scenes report from Empire magazine, it's revealed that the scene in question was shot in a high-tech corridor set, complete with blinking computer monitors and a suitably ominous atmosphere. But when the cameras stopped rolling, things got heated as Arnold Schwarzenegger grew frustrated with a missing crew member. Despite the setback, the scene ultimately made it into the official novelization of Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines, giving fans a glimpse into the dark origins of the unstoppable killing machines. The three deleted scenes in TX vs T850 Battle The epic showdown between the T850 and the TX at Cyber Research Systems was meant to be even more intense. Unfortunately, a few action scenes were cut, leaving some continuity errors in the final product. In one deleted scene, the TX gains the upper hand by pushing the T850 backwards and then viciously smashing his head into the ceiling multiple times. Another deleted scene shows the T850 using his own head as a weapon to strike the TX at least twice, demonstrating his incredible strength and resilience. The final deleted scene is the most gruesome, as the TX reveals her metallic mouth with alloy teeth and bites into the T850's arms, tearing off some skin and spitting it out. TX spots Brewster's plane. In the official T3 novel, the TX emerges from the particle accelerator emergency shaft and sets her sights on a small plane, taking off in the distance. Using her enhanced optical circuits, she identifies the aircraft as a Cessna 180, registered to none other than Robert Brewster himself. With a calculated confidence of 95%, she locks onto her target and sets off in pursuit. More deleted scenes from the trailer. In the T3 domestic trailer, we see an intense scene at Crystal Peak. As John and Kate stand in front of a blast door, a flying piece of debris hurtles toward them prompting them to duck for cover. While the first part of the sequence can be seen in the actual movie, the second part was unfortunately cut from the final edit. But that's not all. The trailer also shows us a brief moment that didn't make it into the movie itself. As the TX grabs John Connor, we see Kate let out a scream, a moment that was left on the cutting room floor. Final battle between TX and T850. The TX is left with her leg sheared off as she clings to John Connor's ankle with her remaining hand. Despite the Terminator's efforts to drag her away, the blast door slowly inches down, trapping them both in a deadly hydraulic press. In a last-ditch effort to save himself and Connor, the Terminator grabs the TX's wrist and throat, but she retaliates with her trusty buzzsaw, driving it into his chest with a sickening crunch. The Terminator's grip tightens on the TX's wrist, causing her hydraulic joints to bend out of position, but she manages to break free and continue her attack. As the door tightens its grip on both the torsos, as the door tightens its grip on both their torsos, the TX brings the saw up into the Terminator's neck and cranial case causing his circuits to short out and his servos to go haywire. Then the Terminator releases his grip on the TX and their optical sensors before the TX crawls under the blast door. Alternate Takes Here are some alternate takes from Terminator 3 that were not included in the final cut. First, there's an alternate shot of the T-850 arriving in a time sphere, which was used in the T-3 Super Bowl spot. In the domestic trailer, there are also shots of the T-850 lifting John at the cemetery, with different color tones between the second and third Japanese trailers. Another sequence is that of a complete shot of the T-850 shooting at the cops at the cemetery, which was only shown as a headshot in the movie. In an early pre-special effect shot, there's a Hertz without the TX on the roof after the cemetery shootout. There are also two different alternate takes of the T-850 saying, She'll be back. One in the first T-3 trailer and another in the gag reel. Finally, there's an alternate shot of the TX walking through the debris and chaos she caused. Terminator Salvation, 2009 The real John Connor's cameo 
In an interview, the director of the fourth installment in the Terminator franchise, McGee, revealed that actor Terry Crews actually did have a cameo in the film, but as a dead character with a bullet in his head. The scene was designed to be a misdirect, with Cruz's character asking if the protagonist, John Connor, was the John Connor, and then realizing he was, in fact, leading the mission. However, McGee ultimately decided to cut the scene from the theatrical release, feeling that it slowed down the opening of the film. In the official novelization of the film, there's a scene where Connor is approached by a captain who asks if he is the John Connor, who was supposed to lead the mission. Connor responds that the plan was no good, and quickly leads his team into action. Civilians take down a T-1 unit. In the original cut of Terminator Salvation, there was a thrilling scene where John Connor and his team encounter a T-1 unit as they descend into a prison to rescue captured humans. The robot emerges from the water behind them and attacks, but the humans quickly take it down with their gunfire. However, this scene was ultimately cut from the theatrical release due to pacing issues, according to executive producer Dan Lin. Fans were disappointed, as the scene had been heavily featured in trailers, the novelization, and comic adaptions of the film. But fear not, as the scene was included in the director's cut for fans to enjoy. Christian vs. Connor In Terminator Salvation, there's a tense scene where John Connor engages in a fight with T-600. Afterwards, he contacts his base via radio, but fans who attended Comic-Con reported that the scene originally had a longer ending. In the theatrical release, Connor calmly says, One. Once. But in the extended version, he's asked to repeat himself and responds again, but is more furious this time, still reeling from the loss he just suffered. It's a powerful moment that adds to the emotional depth, and many fans were disappointed that it was cut from the theatrical release. There was supposed to be a larger conspiracy. In the cramped quarters of the Resistance's submarine, tension runs high as Ashdown holds a gun to John Connor's head. The prophesied leader of the Resistance is interrogated about his recent actions that put the lives of the sub's crew in danger. But Ashdown doesn't believe in prophecy. He knows that the future can be rewritten at any moment. After Connor assures him that they're on the same page, he reveals a shocking discovery. He tells Connor that Skynet is taking human prisoners and using their tissue to create T-800s. Ashdown tries to reassure him that soldiers like them will win the war, but Connor is rightfully concerned. The lines from this deleted scene hint at a larger conspiracy and the stakes of the war, making it all the more unfortunate that it didn't make it into the theatrical cut. Len's Death In the aftermath of Judgment Day, people struggled to survive in a world overrun by machines. Among them was a small group of survivors led by Virginia, who'd managed to secure a valuable source of food and fuel, but their peace was about to be shattered. One of the survivors, Len, had other plans for the precious resources. He confronted Virginia, insisting that it wasn't her choice to make. Tension mounted as Virginia stood her ground. Suddenly, the air was rent by a deafening noise. Marcus and Kyle, two of the survivors, immediately hit the ground. Virginia's companion, Star, did the same. They were just in time, as a bottle Len was holding exploded, causing blood to pool around his neck. Before anyone could react, a giant claw plunged through the ceiling and grabbed Virginia, yanking her out through the roof. A second claw appeared and grabbed another survivor, leaving the group in shock and terror. Skynet actually processed humans. The alternate reality game was a cleverly crafted journey that took fans on an immersive experience through various online sites. One of the hidden gems discovered was a video file that revealed an extended version of the intense scene in which Skynet ruthlessly pushes the helpless humans out of the transport. However, upon closer inspection, fans noticed that two key shots were missing. The first was a chilling glimpse of a group of panicked humans huddled together in the pouring rain, and the second was a bizarre yet intriguing camera angle that followed the line of humans as they were forced to walk down the aisle. These missing shots left fans wondering about the fate of the humans and how these omitted scenes might have changed the entire narrative of the movie. John Connor's Extended Speech In the director's cut of the film, there's an extended radio speech by John Connor where he speaks about his mother, Sarah Connor, and the dire situation they're facing. However, the full version of this speech was revealed in the maximum movie mode on the Blu-ray release. In this version, John Connor implores the Resistance to believe in him, as they should have believed in his mother, who was locked away for her warnings about the future. He stresses that they are not machines, and cannot fight like them if they want to win. Instead, he calls on every member of the Resistance to join him for one final fight, where those who fight with him may live, and those who do not may die. The speech ends with a powerful message of unity and determination to win against Skynet. A quick shot of people listening to his speech was also added in the theatrical cut. John and Kate's Child In the director's cut, John Connor's goodbye to Kate is extended with a subtle reference to their child. As he touches Kate's pregnant belly, it hints at the possibility of their future child becoming a vital part of the Resistance. The scene also features an extra line of dialogue that was featured in many trailers, which said, Win or lose, this war ends tonight.
Interestingly, the issue of Kate's pregnancy wasn't explored in the fourth installment of the Terminator series. Director McGee suggested in an interview that it would be addressed in potential sequels. While it's uncertain if another Terminator sequel will ever be made, the filmmakers have arced out a story that includes the child's fate and its role in the world of man versus machine. Extended footage of Marcus sneaking into Skynet Central We witness Marcus's attempt at infiltration into the heart of Skynet Central. The scene features Marcus sneaking into an eerie church filled with skeletons, which serves as a cover for his mission. However, his cover is blown when an automated Skynet vehicle suddenly appears and obliterates the wall of the church. In a race against time, Marcus must flee for his life and escape the clutches of Skynet's deadly machinery. Hybrids In an early version of the film, Serena was envisioned as a hybrid instead of a computer-generated image. The concept art reveals the filmmakers had intended to give Serena a physical form similar to Marcus. The footage shows Serena conversing with Marcus in a disembodied voice. Behind-the-scenes clips depicts actress Helena Bonham Carter in full hybrid makeup. However, in this version of the story, Marcus would ultimately kill Serena by ripping out her microchip from the back of her neck, causing her to be torn apart by a robotic arm, thus symbolically freeing himself from Skynet's control. In an exclusive clip released by National Cinemedia, we catch a glimpse of the world of Terminator salvation that's even more interesting. Two quick shots showcase hybrid scientists working on humans, encased in what can only be described as skin machines. T-800 uses T-600's weaponry. In one of the intense chase scenes, the T-600, an older model Terminator, stands in the way of the T-800. The T-800, being the ultimate killing machine, quickly destroys the outdated model, ripping it into pieces. However, what wasn't shown in the final cut was that the T-800 took advantage of the opportunity and picks up the T-600's Gatling gun to use against John Connor and Kyle Reese. This scene was featured in the trailers and novelization, but was eventually cut in the final edit, likely due to the need to maintain the pacing of the film's action-packed third act. Fighting T-1s to escape prison One of the most action-packed scenes from the trailers of Terminator Salvation involved the prisoners' uprising and their fight against the machines during their escape. The thrilling footage showed desperate humans climbing on T-1 units and trying to disable them, while others fired their weapons at the relentless T-600s in a chaotic struggle for survival. The scene also featured Kyle and Star running for their lives together and eventually meeting up with Virginia. Unfortunately, this intense sequence wasn't included in the final cut of the film, leaving fans wondering what might have been. Terminator Genesis 2015 Missiles flying around the globe One striking image that was used in the trailers for Terminator Salvation was a quick shot of missiles flying around the globe, suggesting the scale and severity of the war between man and machine. However, this scene didn't appear in the final cut of the film. Another such scene was a chilling shot of frozen feet touching the frigid floor. Future War a sequence of shots shows the human resistance and its struggle in the future war. We see soldiers jumping out of trucks and firing rocket launchers with deadly precision. Multiple choppers could be seen whirring through the air, their rotor blades slicing through the thick clouds of smoke and debris. But one shot that stood out was a glimpse of Carl Reese and John Connor standing inside the Skynet hangar, their eyes fixed on an unseen target. Sadly, this angle didn't make it into the final cut, but we can only imagine the intense battle that raised on at that moment. Punk Leader in what looks like a behind-the-scenes clip, we see a deleted shot from the final movie where the punk leader, previously seen watching the fight between the T-800 and Guardian, runs away in disbelief after witnessing the T-800 being shot. This shot was removed from the final cut, leaving the punk leader's disappearance from the background unexplained. Terminator Dark Fate 2019 Several scenes about Sarah and Danny the initial cut of the movie featured a black screen with only the sound of Sarah's voice from the Pescadero recording. However, the final cut includes footage of Sarah's conversation with Silberman about her nightmare, intercut with the opening logos. Additionally, there were some changes made to Sarah's narration in the opening bar scene, and a new scene was added between Grace and Danny about running to the police. Another new scene was added between Danny and Sarah in a motel room, where Danny expresses her desire to bury her father and brother, but Sarah insists that they need to move on. The Rev-9's tracking of our heroes was also modified to make it seem like he was ahead of them instead of trailing behind, and a scene was added outside Carl's house where Sarah cries about forgetting John's face. Other changes include a scene where our heroes question Carl's relationship with a human woman and different future war flashbacks featuring a new look for Danny. Lastly, the initial cut included a Sarah or Danny voiceover in the last scene, but it was eliminated in the final cut. All in all, these changes add depth and complexity to the characters and story, making for a more engaging cinematic experience. When test audiences slaughter scenes In a scene in the motel room, Danny pours out her heart as she grieves the loss of her father and brother. 
but the test audience found her tears too much to handle and labelled her as weak, unfit to lead the resistance. Amidst the emotional turmoil, Danny delivers a stirring monologue about her brother, a man whose wallet remained unidentified and whose name was forgotten. It was a powerful moment, one that captured her heartbreak because of being alone in a world. And yet again, the test audience thought it was too much to take. Multiple Future War flashback deleted scenes In the original cut of Future War, director Tim Miller had envisioned a gripping fight sequence involving Dragonfly that was longer and more intense. Tom Hopper's character William Hadrill met a brutal end, with Mackenzie fighting to save him in a heart-wrenching scene. In another concept that was brought to life through advanced 3D renders, we saw the medroom of the human resistance in the Future War. Here, we're treated to a glimpse of Grace lying in a hospital bed, her scars from previous enhancements visible for all to see. A promotional picture of Grace holding a futuristic gun further cemented her role as a battle-hardened warrior. The scars on her body indicated that she was already augmented, making her an even more formidable force to be reckoned with. In a deleted scene, Danny is shown sending Grace back to the present, revealing that she was the one who gave her the tattoo of Carl's location. This fact also sheds light on the possibility that Danny was the commander Grace was referring to and protecting in the future, given their close relationship. However, Miller expressed some reservations about the scene as it depicted Danny sending her surrogate child to die for her cause. This conflicted with his original vision and left him feeling dissatisfied with the outcome. Sarah Connor is more badass than we know. In the original cut of Dark Fate, Sarah Connor's scene where she explains killing two Terminators from the past was much longer. As it turns out, Sarah had been a busy bee, eliminating every Terminator that Skynet sent back to kill John Connor. These slow bullets would come through time, and Sarah would be there waiting, ready to end their sorry existences. Director Tim Miller wanted to make it explicitly clear that Sarah was the one responsible for taking out these Terminators. In the current version of the movie, Sarah mentions killing two, but in the extended scene, there were many more. As Sarah sits in the car with the other characters, she talks about how it happened again and again, highlighting just how formidable she's become in her fight against the machines. Rev 9 In a clever move, the Rev 9 turns to an unsuspecting internet cafe to track down our heroes. After acquiring the information it needs, the deadly machine leaves without paying leaving a curious waitress holding up something in confusion. However, the filmmakers decided to tweak Rev 9's pursuit of our protagonists. Instead of trailing behind them, the Rev 9 uses its advanced hacking abilities to access a surveillance installation, revealing that their final destination is Laredo, Texas. The machine then unleashes its deadly power on a border station, wiping out everyone in its path before hacking into a drone to stay one step ahead of the group. This change not only amps up the danger and tension of the Rev 9's pursuit, but also establishes the machine as a formidable adversary. From lost subplots to alternate endings, these moments provide a window into the creative process behind these iconic films. While some of these scenes may have been cut for a good reason, others suggest intriguing possibilities that never came to fruition. Which scenes did you want in the movies? Let us know your thoughts, suggestions, and corrections in the comments.